What's going on, y'all? This is Mike Brown. I'll be trying to get my influencer on on the beginning of these episodes. But this is Mike Brown of The Art of Letting Go. And I wanted to welcome you to this week's episode. While I have your attention, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast. Also, leave a review. Let me know what you think. Let other people know what you think. I love to hear from y'all. Also, if you want some more exclusive content from the show, from me, You can log on to Patreon. We got a Patreon, so please subscribe. Thank you. Yo, what up? This is Mike Brown, and this is The Art of Letting Go. Shout out to uh, our live audience that's here. This is my first time having a live audience, so this is really cool. I wanted to welcome today's guest, a special guest. Uh, Our first episode we did together was last year, and it was for Mental Health Awareness Month. And I called it Therapy 101. So this is like Therapy 102, like the uh, the more in-depth version of that. <laughs> Do you mind introducing yourself to the people? Okay, you froze for me for a second, but you're back. Did you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. I said, uh, do you mind introducing yourself to the people? Sure. My name is Karen Balumbu Bennett. I am a psychotherapist based out of Long Beach, California. I am a school-based therapist by day, and then I have a private practice by night. I'm also um, a speaker, and I am a new author. I'm actually really excited about that. Um, And yeah, I have been in the Long Beach area for the past 20 years, which is crazy. So I think I can officially just I I think claim Long Beach as my home. That's what's up. That's dope. How are you feeling today? I feel good. I'm tired. It's the end of the school year. It's a lot. Kids are tired. Staff are tired, you know. So it was a long day, but um, I love doing um, talks and being able to be with you, family, to talk about one of my favorite topics mental health, mental health awareness, maternal mental health. So I'm feeling good about that. That's dope. And uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, being in the schools and also me just thinking about like teacher appreciation week ending like maybe like a week or two ago. But uh, how has it been for you being in education? Because I know for me, I, I talk about it a lot here, but just how stressful the job is and, you know, just the work that we do, it, it's pretty exhausting right now, just, you know, with everything that we've experienced. But how has it been for you? Yeah, it's been hard. You know, I think that the transition for students from coming from being at home for a year and then returning to the school. Some of them have experienced loss, some trauma. Um, So that transition has been difficult, but it was nice being back in person because doing virtual therapy with teenagers who aren't interested in actually receiving therapy is a little challenging. Um, So now that I'm actually in person with them, I can kind of get them up and moving which is a little bit, um, it's, it's beneficial for, I think, the therapeutic process when you're, when you're that young. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, a question that just popped in my mind right now is, uh, what advice would you give to educators right now as far as like taking care of their mental health? Man, if you haven't done it before and you're an educator, you definitely should be taking care of yourself now. Because the demands that the school district have, the state, the parents, the students, yourself maybe too, you may be even comparing what you used to be able to do and not really looking at just life in this season and realizing that we are living in a very abnormal time with this whole pandemic. We're adjusting so much and, you know, you have to show yourself grace and really take care of yourself. So I definitely advise um, teachers to take time off, really enjoy their summer. Um, I know a lot of them have to work, uh, you know, during summer to make extra money because we live in California and life is hard. But if they can take time off for themselves and really rest and enjoy life, I definitely recommend that. And you know what? 
this is the first year that I've actually taken time off throughout the year, like taking a day or two here and there. And I think there is some guilt that lies in like, you know, step, you know, education is different than like any other job I've ever experienced. Like, you know, if I worked at Nike or I worked at whatever company I worked at, I, it'd be nothing to call off, but something about school, it makes you feel almost guilty to not be there. No, I agree with you. I think that we feel like we're letting our students down if we miss a day of school. And a lot of times when you become a helper, I feel like helping professionals tend to forget to care for themselves. They give, 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 they pour, 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 and they just forget to care for themselves. And there is that guilt associated with it. I've definitely experienced that. Like, oh my gosh, I can't be absent. Like the student is waiting on me. I have to show up. And at the end of the day, they'll be okay. And if they're not, we can process through that because you have to care for yourself and we have to get rid of that guilt. Yeah. What are your tools right now that you're using? What are your tools for mental health? Mm, So self-care is my thing. And I had to really learn how to care for myself because that wasn't something that I was taught. It wasn't something that I even really remember seeing my parents do. Um, So self-care, when I talk about it, it's like, it's huge for me. I'm really reshaping like my belief systems. Um, So some of the things that I do walking, going on hikes. I love being in nature. I love being outdoors. As long as there's not too many bugs and like creatures, I love the outdoors. Um, So definitely doing more walking, being outdoors, outdoor yoga has been amazing too when I get to do, when I get to do that. And then just at home, journaling is my thing, meditating, praying. Those are some of my other favorite things to do. That's dope. That's really dope. And uh, I know you mentioned journaling and you just recently wrote a book. I did. Congratulations. Thank (laughs) you. Thank you. What was that process like for you? It was intense. It was intense. A lot of it's intense. The whole book writing process is intense. I had to learn a lot. Um, But honestly, just creating. So it's a guided journal. It's a guided journal. So I use book and guided journal interchangeably. But what it is, is um, I say book because it's a memoir meets guided journal. So um, I focus on the fertility challenges that I experienced. And I basically have each chapter, I tell a short story about whatever I was going through during that time. And I use different therapeutic terminology to kind of explain the grief and loss and the trauma associated with fertility challenges. And then I guide the reader with some guided questions so that they can also process and journal about whatever they're experiencing. Um, Whether it's, you know, they, they're trying um, to conceive and, or they miscarried, you know, whatever the the situation may be within the, um, within their journey. And so um, the book actually, the journal actually started by me expounding on some of the, the journal entries that I had while I was going through my own fertility challenges. So that was a very emotional and interesting process um, to just kind of expound off of my own personal thoughts and experiences. Um, And then so from that, it it grew and I decided what I wanted to do with it. And then just learning the whole, that author process is a very different thing. And it it took me way longer than I thought because I didn't know like the whole self-publishing experiences. It's new. It's it's hard, but I'm so proud because I'm glad I didn't give up even though I wanted to so many times. Yeah. What what kept you going? What kept you to stick to it? Mm. You know, I think that once it was written, I knew I wanted to write it, right? So I was really that's the part that I knew how to do. I'm not a writer. I um it's actually funny because people sometimes compliment me on some things that I write, but I like went to college um on a probationary like standard i had to do like remedial english classes before i could even enter into long beach state um i had to take remedial classes before and while i was a freshman at long beach state so like english is not my strength right but one thing i learned through this journey is that sometimes your purpose and your gift may not be your strength but what you're giving is what people need 
you know, and this process really like showed me that. So the writing was like, I was with that. I wasn't going to quit on that. But once I start the whole formatting and finding graphic designers and I want to quit so many times, but I was just so far, like it didn't make any sense. I'm like, you already wrote the whole thing. Like, how do you quit now? <laughs> like you have to keep going. Right. So for me, it was like, you can't quit. And there's so much I want to do with this journal that it just didn't make any sense. I was like, you have to keep going. Like you, you, you conceived your child, but you also conceived this like drive to support other people who are going through fertility challenges. So you can't quit on them, you know? Um, so it was some of that as well. Did you feel any fear in writing the book? I did. I did because just fertility challenge is so personal. Like people don't talk about their fertility challenges. It's not something that people share often. Like it's becoming, we're trying to start talking about it more, but there's so much shame and guilt that's associated with it that it's so private. Right. And so one of the things, one of the reasons why I was really driven actually to complete it was because when, um, when we were going through it, my husband and I were going through our fertility challenges, like we didn't really talk to too many, many people about it. Like we really just kind of dealt with it on our own. And then sometimes we didn't even talk to each other about it. And that caused a lot of risk as well. So it really was important for me to keep going because I'm like, even though I'm scared to put myself out there, I'm still scared. Like whenever I, I could post on Instagram all day, but whenever I'm about to post about like fertility challenges, like I feel it, like I feel like the self-consciousness like rise up on you know in me and I create a whole journal but I'm still like scared to like open up that conversation um but yeah I just had to keep thinking like you're not just doing this for yourself like it's healing for you yes but you're also doing this to hopefully help others heal man I I really appreciate you sharing that because uh and I don't I don't know if it's common or not, but I do feel like in the last like five or six years, I've heard it more common for women, especially like, you know, women our age to have uh, fertility challenges. Yeah. And it's not so uncommon. Like one in eight couples will struggle with fertility challenges or one in eight women will struggle with fertility challenges. Excuse me. Um, and one in 10 couples, it's the same number basically. So one in eight will struggle. Right. Um, and it can be, you know, I know it's like one in eight, one in 10, uh, it's still like over 7 million, um, that will struggle. And at the end of the day, it can be a male factor. It could be a female factor or it could be under like undisclosed, like they don't know, um, or undetermined, excuse me. And so, a lot of times too, we think of it as only being a woman's problem. And it's it's not always just a woman's problem. It can be a male problem as well. Um, but I think that that's like getting men to start talking about that too. That's, we got to work on that as well, because, you know, there's shame and guilt in that too. Like I should be able to conceive, I should be able to have a child. So there's a lot of shame and guilt in that, but we are seeing a new trend where women are trying to be more open and more vulnerable, you know, about it, which is amazing because it's giving other women the strength to share and really ultimately to find community because it can be a very, a very isolating experience. Man, that, that sounds very important, uh, community. Cause I was going to ask like, how do you, cause I mean, it almost sounds like you're still like working through, like still doing the work through like some of the, the shame or, you know, the, the stuff that may come up with that. Uh, what is like one tool that you use to work through like to get through that presently yeah no for me presently I think that for me giving so really because I'm on this end of it I'm able to be supportive to people who are struggling and so that has been very healing for me um I think when you're in it you do have to really turn to people and like if you're really struggling you may need support you may need to tell someone at work so they can kind of help you out and look out for you um, because it's kind of like a silent grief, right? It's not like if you have a miscarriage, people may not have even known you were pregnant, right? So you may be really hurting, but you still go to work. You're not taking bereavement days. You're still going to work and you're functioning versus if you lose a live person, right? Where people know 
then there's more support that's given to you. So it, it's you do have to really care for yourself and whether that's taking time off from work, whether that is journaling, um, maybe that's even just trying to escape for a day and just watching some fun TV, but you have to figure out what you can do for yourself. And ultimately, if you really need a lot of support, then therapy, of course, I'm a therapist, I'm going to advocate that you seek therapy as needed. And I appreciate you sharing that so much. Um, what, and actually, before I ask that question, I was going to ask, when you were able to conceive, like, what was that feeling like for you? Like, you know, after having the challenges and then being able to conceive, like, what was that feeling like? Mm, that was like a roller coaster of emotions. It's scary. It's scary. You're excited, but you're so scared because the trauma and the grief, the loss, like everything that you experienced leading up to this moment, that doesn't go away, you know? Um, and we did IVF. So we ultimately did IVF and that was successful, um, which is amazing because it's not always successful. But I, I really lived my entire pregnancy in fear. I honestly did. I had a difficult pregnancy as well. Um, I had some other complications, but I really just lived it in fear. And that was very difficult because you, because of all the challenges, you're kind of stripped of that innocent, just new mom, new dad feel of we are having a baby that's stripped from you because you're kind of, you're filled now with all of the hurt and the trauma that led to this part of your journey or preceded this part of your journey. Wow. Wow. Um, what is one piece of advice or like just some, some inspiration that you can give to women going through their own uh, fertility challenges? I think if I had to pick one, I would say, um, don't do it alone. Find community. Community care is is beautiful. Find people that you can trust, that you can open up to, that you can talk to, who are good listeners and not always trying to be fixers. And and just find a good support network because this is a very difficult process and you shouldn't do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. So now we are going to get into some listener questions. So this segment of the show is called Ask Me a Question. <laughs> All right. So our first question comes from me and I will play it. So today I'm definitely feeling mentally exhausted. I'm feeling mentally overwhelmed. And with my role as a mother, like I honestly don't feel like, I honestly feel like this is the most rewarding job I could ever possibly have. But I can't ignore the fact that I, I, I get tired. And I think to myself, does it ever get easier? Also, like, there's a sense of guilt that comes along with it because while my husband is getting up every day, going to work, like, I'm home. And even though, like, I'm not physically working, like, I'm, I'm breastfeeding, I'm cleaning the house, like, I'm expected to still cook and, you know, all of these things, which my husband does give me grace on, but it's just like, I feel like I'm working three jobs, yet there's still a guilt feeling that I'm not working hard enough. My question is, and I I feel like I know the answer to it already, but does it get any easier? And how, like, what is the best way to express to your loved ones, to your partner, like, that... Just because you're working a job doesn't make what I do on a day-to-day -day basis less significant because 
I don't know. Does that make sense? I try my best to like form it in a question, but like, how do you express to your loved ones? Like your job is like most likely three times harder than theirs. Um. So no, I love that I gave some context because moms are really having a hard time out here. Um, and unfortunately there's been this idea within our culture because we've seen our moms and our grandmas and our great grandmas do it, that moms are like just super human, you know, where they are supposed to be able to care for everyone and have the laundry done and have food ready. And, um, part of the challenge is that we ourselves as mom, we hold on to these beliefs. And so we are having a hard time shaking it. And there's that guilt, like you were saying, that you're holding on to because you yourself are struggling with probably um, relieving yourself of some of these unattainable, unrealistic responsibilities when you are caring for another human. And I would say that um, that's the first thing I would ask you to try to do is to try to give yourself grace and to try to relinquish these ideas that you have to be on top of everything. And then when it comes to talking to your partner, those are difficult conversations. And, you know, some people actually end up going to couples therapy to support them with that because it's, um, it's challenging. It is challenging. But there's so much research and studies that show that women, moms who are working from home or who are just even at home, are carrying so much of the household responsibility that it's really drowning them. And so um, sometimes if we come off where we're trying to say, you know, I'm doing more or you're doing more, that can become a very tit for tap conversation. I think for you, what, what ultimately what I'm hearing from you is that you need support. So my advice is always to communicate what you need and just say like, I am overwhelmed. I need help. And if that means that your partner can help you in some ways and they're willing to and able to do it. Amazing. If you have to, and if you do have a support system and you could tap into that and really ask for support for support. And I always say ask for and accept support because so often we've been conditioned to just say, Oh no, I'm fine. I could do it versus like really accepting the help that you need. Um, that would be probably my other advice is to really put it out there, ask for the help, just communicate that I need help um, and receive the help that you hopefully get. And then also to give yourself some grace to let the house get a little messy. I get it. That's hard, you know, to maybe eat out a bit, to maybe eat some leftovers, just to kind of rem to remind yourself that you're in a different space, you're in a different season. So the way that maybe you were organized before, it, it may not be happening right now. And that's okay. Thank you for that. Um, the these two questions are from Lottie Dottie. Um, can dads babysit their own baby? <laughs> <laughs> Lottie Dottie, I love it. <laughs> How are you gonna babysit your own baby? <laughs> <laughs> it's your child. I'm not babysitting my child. Even though I do joke sometimes, like, oh, I got to babysit tonight. <laughs> so I think it's actually really funny when people say it. But at the end of the day, you're just caring for your child, just like the mom or um, the other parent is caring for their child. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> the second question, which I was curious about, and I don't really know if I have a full opinion on it, but I do kind of have some ideas, but can okay. we speak to toxic femininity? What do I mean by toxic femininity? I don't know. I'm not too sure. And, uh, <laughs> like it, it made me curious though. Cause I was like, I've never, I've never heard anybody ask or speak of that. And it was asked by a woman. So that's why I was curious. Like, Hmm. Toxic femininity. And and I could give you an example of something that pops in my mind of okay. toxic okay. femininity, but it also, I think it's still connected to toxic masculinity, is the idea of calling every man gay. Like, 
Mm-hmm. You know, I I hear women do that a lot. Like, oh, he gay, or you know, and and a man may not even be gay. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, I think just the question of sexuality feels a little toxic. But you know, that, mm. that also, like I said, is tied to something that somebody else has already put out there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because yeah, what what you're saying, I definitely think that's derogatory, and it's it's just how people use sexuality or gender as like an insult. Like you're acting like a woman, you know? Like you're acting gay. Like it's just like, why is that even an insult? <laughs> you know? So we got to even change the way that we are trying to like clown people. Like that's not okay. Um, Cause what does that even mean? You know, like, what does that mean? Um, so, but yeah, I, I honestly have never even heard the term toxic femininity. Yeah. So I don't know. And it could be a new buzz term. There's so many new terms and I can barely keep up. Um, but I would have to get more examples on what that even looks like because you know whatever is like the marginalized group is kind of put into this category of like or like you know like in in america black people are racist it's like eh, well are we really racist in america you know like toxic femininity femininity well what does that really mean you know so i just i don't know <laughs> like yeah i would have i would have to know more about that yeah <laughs> Um, and I have three more listener questions. These are from Prodigy 5002. And the first is after hearing all these stories of life from so many clients and patients, um, is a particular idea or theme about people uh what is a particular idea or theme about people that you've learned? Okay, can you repeat that? Can you start from the beginning one more time? After hearing all the stories of life from all of your clients and patients, what is a particular idea or theme about people that you've learned? Okay, I love that. Um, You know, I remember when I started working years ago, I worked for a department of mental health and... um, And I was just meeting so many different people from different walks of life. I loved my clients there. Um, Being a county employee is just difficult because there's so much paperwork involved. And so you end up probably figuring it out or you leave. And I ended up leaving. But my time there, I just really, you go into these programs and you're like, okay, you're going to be working for the psychiatric emergency team. And you're going to have to place people on hold and hospitalize them. Or you're going to work for this intensive program. And, you know, your clients are going to be. Um, have high recidivism for incarceration and um, high recidivism for homelessness and hospitalization. And you have all these ideas of what you're going to see. And then you just meet everyone. You're just like, we're, we all have challenges. We all have challenges, but you know, some of us have maybe a few more protective factors um, than others, some more privileges than others. And so I think one of the things that I left with is that we all are, are struggling. We all are, are, are having challenges. And that's really left me um, to have more just empathy for people. Um, because, you know, someone can just be giving you an attitude and it really helped me just start to externalize all that stuff and not make it personal. Because I just started to really see that we all have challenges. But I think some of us, I think some of us just have more protective factors and more privileges. And that helped us go this way versus going that way. The second question is, how does self-care look different for a therapist than it might for most other people? Um, I don't know if it looks completely different. I would say that the biggest difference I can maybe see, and I would just say for helping professionals in general, so that can be a teacher, a doctor, you know, just anyone who's like, quote unquote, a helping for professional I think that sometimes that means changing your caseload. Um, I think that could mean um, reducing the amount of people maybe you see. Um, if it's a teacher, maybe not working your, I think that's called like auxiliary, or you're supposed to have a break and sometimes teacher work that. So maybe not doing that, but really trying to create that space for you because you do give so much. 
and you support so many people that you really need some quiet time. Um, so I think for me, sometimes one of my um, self-care can just be like a do not disturb or or just actually not, not answering a phone call and responding like, you know, I can't talk right now. I'll get back to you. Um, and that really could be because I've just been talking all day and I've been listening all day and I just can't do it anymore. Um, so where someone else who maybe isn't, you know, talking and listening to people all day, that may not be one of their go-to self-care activities. Yeah. Um, and the last one is what are your feelings on the need for therapists to have therapists? And it says, unpack that a bit for me. I think it's beautiful for therapists to have therapists. We are human. We are human. We're going through so much. Um, we're going through life, you know? So like we're going through life at the same time, we're here to support other people. So I think it's, um, I think it's necessary for therapists to know when they need to get therapy. Right. So I know that there are some people who will be like, if you're a therapist and have a therapist run away. And I don't necessarily think that's true because you know, hopefully we're living long lives and throughout your life, the idea is not for you to have to go to therapy every single week for the rest of your life. The idea is for you to go to therapy um, when you need it or for little booster sessions, you know, and to hold on to those coping skills so that you can use them when life does get a little difficult. Um, But I think that it's, um, I love the fact that a lot of therapists are talking about it and they're promoting it. I will say this, it's hard. I actually um, wanted, I started my journey to try to find a therapist. I had a lot of transitions going on and that's, that's been hard. I like stopped and now I'm, I actually reached out to some therapists that I know to say like, who do you go to? And so I just recently got some referrals because I just had so many transitions. There's a lot that I'm doing. I'm feeling very overwhelmed. I just need to process this with someone who's unbiased and, you know, doesn't have any personal connection with me. But because I am trying to grow my network as well, I connect with so many therapists on a daily basis that I can't have them be my therapist because they're like now my work friends. So that's been one of the greatest challenges. And therapists will tell you that it's hard for us to actually find therapists because um, you can't you can't get receive therapy from someone that you have a personal relationship with. Yeah. And a question that just popped in my head is. as a therapist and having a therapist, how do you go into therapy without like analyzing your therapist? Does that make sense? No, that does make sense. That does make sense. And you know what? I think that you have to humble yourself and you have to remember that you don't know it all. Right. And I think it's the same thing. Like for, um, I was just talking to a, one of my doctors. I had a few, like I had a surgery and I, I have all these different doctors I'm working with right now. And, you know, I think one of them was like, oh, you have to go see my primary care doctor. And we started having that conversation about like, you know, he's a doctor going to see his doctor and, you know, as a therapist going to see a therapist. It's like at the end of the day, we all have different skills and we can all help point out different things. And when you're in it, it's so hard to see it. Right. Even even doctors will be like, oh, I'm not sick. I'm okay. I'm okay. And it's like, go to the hospital. Like, what are you doing? But if someone else came to them and was like, oh my gosh, I don't, I'm not feeling well, I have all these symptoms, their first thing would say, oh, go, their first um, response would say, would be to go see your doctor. So you just have to remember, I think, to remind yourself that you don't know it all. <laughs> you don't know it all. And this person's here to help you. And like any of us, if you're not clicking with someone, then you should reevaluate if you feel like this person isn't right for you. Because yeah, I do. I'm not a specialist in like eating disorders. So I personally wouldn't even take you if that's what you said was your primary concern. Now, if you said it was something else, if you just said it was anxiety and then four sessions in, we realized that it's really like an eating disorder. I may have to say, you know what? I may not be the right person for you. Let's see if we can find you enough, another therapist. And I think that that's something that all therapists should do. And even you as someone going to receive therapy, you should be able to see like, okay, maybe this isn't working for me and I can find someone else. Yeah. Do you think it's important to have a therapist that uh is from like, because I hear a lot of people say like, 
like black people say they want a black therapist or you know queer people say they want a queer therapist like how important is it for your therapist to like i guess align with with your life i think that there's a benefit in it for sure I think that um, there are issues that Black people have. There are issues that queer people have. There's issues that any marginalized person may have, a disabled person may have, that they will feel like someone who looks like them or has a similar experience as them may be able to connect with them and just understand them more. Um, And I feel like that's definitely the case. I think I can be in a room with a Black woman and I'm just like, she gets me, you know? Um, but I do think at the end of the day, it really depends on what you're seeking therapy for. So I think that for so long, people do focus on it has to look, the person has to look like me, but one, that person can look like you and have a completely different experience than you. Right. So every black woman doesn't have the same experiences as me. So for me personally, to be honest, I think that I need to have someone that's like marginalized in some capacity. So. Um, I would prefer for me personally, like a woman of color, right, would be probably what I would align with. A queer male would be probably more of someone I would align with, right? Like, I don't know if I would necessarily go see a white male or even just a, a black male, maybe. But I think that a queer male has is more marginalized. And I feel like there's just things that they may get as a marginalized individual themselves. Um, a black male is marginalized, you know, I know that, but, um, just, you know, they, a, a black queer male would have a more, um, I feel like we'll be able to connect with me in a different level, if that makes sense. It does. It definitely does. Um, do you think there's ever a point where the client therapist relationship can feel too comfortable and the, the client isn't benefiting from that relationship? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that happens. And people have mixed views about that. So there, there's, I've definitely experienced where I've had just a client coming every week. And I'm just like, at this point, <laughs> you're just coming to hang out. Like we're not, you're not doing any of the things I'm suggesting or not even suggesting anything that you even come up with therapy where you say you're going to do and implement. Like, you know, the next week you'll come back. And I'm like, okay, so did you do that thing you said you're going to do? And I was like, no, nah, I didn't do that. You know, but let me tell you about what happened with me and, and, and Tyrone, you know, so it just becomes more of a friendship. Um, but you may have other therapists who'll look at that and say, well, that's them just building rapport. And that's beautiful too, because maybe there's no one in their life that listens to them. Maybe there's no one in their life that gives them that space to just hear them out and not pass um, judgment and just be. So um, I I understand that, but I do think that it can get so comfortable and border friendship that if it does, it's really important for the therapist to check that and to kind of figure that out and to be okay with moving the client on because maybe that's all the client did get from you. Like therapy, you may not change your whole life with your first therapist. That may just be you getting comfortable and you realizing that you, you can talk to people and you can put your guard down and you can trust like that's beautiful and that's okay. But maybe then the next therapist, can be the person that really lets you talk about that deep rooted, you know, childhood trauma that you didn't maybe do with the first therapist. And that doesn't mean that the first therapist was bad. It just means that maybe that was the purpose of that relationship to get you comfortable opening up. Yeah. Um, what is one tip or a piece of advice you would like to leave people with about mental health? I think that I want to leave people with the idea that it's important for us to not be bystanders when it comes to our mental health. We really need to be proactive. We need to be intentional and we need to care for ourselves. It's May's Mental Health Awareness Month. I love this month. Um, I'm glad you had me on on this month because it really creates that dialogue around the fact that this is something that we all have to talk about. One in five people develop a mental illness, right? That's 20% of the population will develop. And I think those, I think that number is low, honestly. But so it's really important for all of us to be mindful, be aware, 
and to be proactive about managing our mental health. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Karen, where, when is your book going to be available? I'm hoping June. I'm hoping June. Um, when I log off with you, I'm actually going to be emailing my formatter. So I am hoping June we can formally release it, but you can go to shop Karen, the therapist.com and, um, you can pre-order there. And then um, the actual release date, hopefully I'll be announcing that soon, but I'm thinking June. That's what's up. That's what's up. Can you let the people know where they can find you? Yes, you can find me at KarenTheTherapist.com for my website, Karen the Therapist on Instagram. And then, um, like I mentioned, shop KarenTheTherapist.com. That's my new online wellness store that I just created. And you can also find the pre-order for my journal called uh, My Baby Journey on my website as well. That's what's up. Karen, thank you so much for coming back through. We always appreciate having you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. (laughs) And thank y'all for tuning in. Thank y'all for being here for the first live virtual episode so thank y'all for being here this is mike brown and this is the art of letting go peace thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the art of letting go if you like what you heard please be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast also leave a review let me know what you think let other people know what you think it helps so much um i would love to hear from y'all you know we got the segment on the show ask me a question where you could ask me or the guest any questions that you would like and we will respond you can hit us up on the dm on any social media you can call the phone line or you can send an email the art of letting go podcast at gmail.com also you can go to the art of letting go podcast.com find merch find ask me a question or if you want to be a guest it's all there thank y'all for listening peace